Stocks are rallying today as the midterm elections are in full swing, and history suggests there are big gains ahead. Bob Bassani is at the New York Stock Exchange with more. Hi, Bob. Hello, Melissa. Lots of happy talk down here. There's all sorts of talk on Wall Street. The markets will rally after the election. There is a good reason for all this happy talk, actually. The markets do tend to rally after midterm elections, regardless of who wins. The numbers are amazing, short-term and long-term. Since 1980, for example, the S&P has traded up an average 8.5% in the fourth quarter. Since World War II, this is even better, the S&P has been up an average 14.5%. That's one year later. But more importantly, it's been up a year later every single time. 18 out of 18 times. That's a pretty good record. But this is a very unusual election, and not everybody thinks that gridlock in Washington, which is the consensus on the election, will be good for stocks. So remember, much of the benefit to stocks in the last two years has come because we were not in a gridlock environment. That's how the tax cuts got through. Now, looking forward, there's very little chance that the Trump tax cuts will be rolled back with the Republican Senate, assuming that. But there's also very little chance the tax cuts will be made permanent with the Democratic House. More stimulus may be a lot tougher to come by. A lot of Republicans believe they may become much more concerned with rising deficits, the traditional Republican concern, and that would leave very little room for stimulus spending, particularly in all these infrastructure projects everybody wants and nobody can agree on how to pay for. And if there's even a hint of slowing in the economy, the president will likely try to blame the Federal Reserve for raising rates, which will put them in a box that will make it difficult for them to back down. The Democrats will certainly launch a long investigation into the president's finances if they win the House. Trade tensions will continue, and rates will likely keep rising. My bottom line here, Melissa, this is a very different environment from November 2017 when tax cuts were imminent. I guess the biggest problem I have is that in the last two years, the market was going up. The strategists say because we didn't have gridlock. Now the market is <clears throat> supposed to go up because we do have gridlock. I guess I have... Only Wall Street strategists could get away with that kind of logic, I guess. <laughs> All right, Bob, thanks. Bob Visani at the okay. NYSE. Of course, at the Fed meeting tomorrow, the trade war still ongoing. Our next guest says this midterm will be different. Let's bring in Jeffrey Mills, the co-chief investment strategist at PNC Financial Services. Jeff, good to see you. Thanks for having me. Um, your baseline scenario, though, is that the markets are priced for gridlock. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's generally the case. I mean, where it could be different potentially is that in 2016, there was this massive policy pendulum shift. And clearly that's driven the market to a large degree over the past two years. So in the sense that the result of this midterm is a referendum on those policies on Trump, and not that they're going to change immediately, even next quarter, next year, but investors may say this is foreshadowing 2020. The policy pendulum could swing back in the other direction. I think that's where this may be different. Bob quoted the statistics, 18 about 18. We all, we all know the track record, and I think it's probably going to still be intact. But I do think that's the risk because we've had such big changes in policy that maybe aren't typical. Right. But at the same time, even though the pendulum, the pendulum has swung, and even if there is gridlock, that pendulum, in theory, will remain suspended to where it is, if not even if it doesn't go further with what we're calling a red wall. Right. I think it's a term that we're coining on the show. Um, so you're saying, though, that it's really the things that are decided outside the midterms that will ultimately determine the direction of the markets and how fast they rise or fall. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, a, a big part of it's going to be CapEx, and that is decided outside of the midterms to a degree. You know, you think about trade policy um, and really that effect on CEO confidence, because th that's going to be the key. You see how CEO confidence is levered to CapEx. So if trade drags on too long, CEOs start to pull back on that CapEx. You're not going to get a boost to productivity and economic growth potential is basically going to be what it's been for a very long time. But I do think when thinking about moving past the midterm elections, and this relates to trade, yes, it's important to just put that uncertainty aside. But I, what I think is maybe a little bit underappreciated is the fact, and you used this during power lunch today, that basically uh, it's the economy. Gold stupid. star. <laughs> so, and it is the economy, stupid. And I think that presidents realize that. So if you go back after the midterm elections pass, this self-preservation mechanism starts to kick in and presidents start to think about their own re-election. And they, they institute policies that might be a surprise. Obama did it in 2010. So there's a Trump put in the market. Potentially. So o Obama did it in 2010 with extending the Bush tax cuts, probably a surprise to a lot of people. And then now you think about the biggest lever that Trump has to pull. It's probably on trade. So nobody expects to deal with China. 
But is he an ideologue who is just going to stick with that and make no compromise? Or is he a deal maker who has, you know, high self-preservation instincts and then he may make uh, a compromise? So you're talking about policy shifts, point. though, Jeff. What about just rising rates, right? Is that enough to really hit a wall against everything that you just talked about, all the positives? We have rising rates. Does that fail, stop short of everything that's positive in this marketplace when we, once we start focusing on that again? Yeah, I, I, and I think that it, it largely depends on that. And it's going to have to do with how fast the Fed decides to move relative to what they perceive as the neutral rate. Like right now, I don't think we've moved into this new growth paradigm where we're all of a sudden growing at 3 or 4%. So I think the neutral rate probably still is somewhere around 3 so that gives them some latitude to move, maybe a hike at the end of this year, maybe two next year. But if they just go on autopilot, continue to raise rates, that could be a major risk. So I think you have to keep that in mind for sure. Can we distill this conversation, Jeff? I mean, if your base case scenario is the markets are priced for gridlock and that there could be a Trump put because of the notion that he wants to ensure his reelection in 2020, does that mean you're constructive stock market? It does mean we're constructive okay. on the stock market. I mean, you think about this is obviously lower than we are now, but you yeah. think the line in the sand from technicians, 20, um, 2585 is what they've said. If you think about where earnings are likely to come in next year, 178 consensus, even dial that back for typical earnings revisions, you're going to have to see a pretty big drop in multiples in order for us to remain at these levels right now. So I think given where earnings are likely to come in, yeah, we are constructive going forward. Jeff, thanks. Jeff Mills of thanks so much. NC. The notion of the Trump put is interesting. I think that we would all yeah. agree that, that a president wants to be reelected. And the thing about China trade, unlike USMCA, is that it doesn't need congressional approval, really. I mean, really, the deal is cut between the two leaders. Right. And in, he's more in control of that than with a NAFTA And issue. embedded in that conversation is the fact that if the President Trump decides it's time to make a deal, the Chinese will say it's time to make. I'm not certain that I guess my point all along has been President Trump might be ready to make a deal. It doesn't mean the Chinese are ready. That's a concern. When would he make that deal, though? Talking about the Trump put in a 2020 yeah. election. Why make away. it right now? Right. Oh, so let it pro get prolonged and yeah, make it I mean, in 2019. The, nobody will remember the trade by 2020 if he does it in the short term. Yeah, I. I but I, I'm constructive nonetheless. <laughs> I, I think uh, Jeff made some great points. I think that's absolutely what he'll do. And it's also surprising that he didn't do that going into midterms. Why not trump the economy? Why not trump job markets? Why not trump wages that are the best in a decade? But look, this this is shaping up for a nasty Q1 2000, like 2016 light. Um, if you think about where the Fed's going to possibly end the year, okay, we get the seasonal thing. Yeah, la, -li la di da. We're oversold. We could rally into that. But you're faced smack in the first quarter with some serious. I think Trump gets tougher on trade right after the midterm elections. I think the market sinks off those headlines and then rallies quickly by Thanksgiving or so into the oh, last. That last. Yeah, I mean, I got the crystal ball here, so we might as well yeah. use it. So into year end seasonality. Q1, though, I think is too tough. I think you want to sell stocks Q1.